Thank you, David. It's uh, good to be back with you. Uh, I thought when Rebecca was asking about running, she was looking at me. And uh, I, I really was hoping she'd say, if anybody's going to make a resolution to plow in the new year, I said, I'll raise my hand. But she didn't ask that. She wanted to know if we were, if we were running. And as you can tell, I'm not a runner. I'm a, I'm a plow horse. I, I tell you, people are like horses. They're all different shapes and sizes. And yet they all have a purpose. Amen? And that's important because uh, when I played football, I was the left side. And when I played baseball, I was the catcher and the backstop. So you know what I mean? So all of us have tremendous opportunities, and God gives us that. Today, I, I want to say thank you to Pastor Barry, who has graciously asked me to come and speak. I'm always humbled and honored that he would ask me to come. And by the way, I have the privilege of working with Barry, so thank you, HBC, for sharing him with us. Uh, as you know, I'm in Region 4 which covers from Salem all the way to the borders, east and west, uh, about 70% of the state of Oregon, with about 45% of the population, and approximately 70 churches uh, in Region 4, which this church is one of those. And Barry works uh, for about six months out of the year with us in what we call the, the pastor cluster. And he's helping us, this is his second year in the Eugene. So thank Thank you for letting Barry assist our pastors, uh, kind of iron sharpening iron, and he does that on a monthly basis, usually starting in October, and we usually end about May. And so thank you for giving him that privilege. I also bring you greetings from Dr. Randy Adams, the Executive Director of the Northwest Baptist Convention, and about almost 500 churches in Oregon, Washington, and the Panhandle of Idaho. And this church, by the way, you need to know something this church right here gives as much as any church in the Northwest Baptist Convention through the cooperative program and through Lottie Moon Christmas offering and Annie Armstrong Easter offering. So I just want you to give yourself a hand. Would you do that? Thank you so much for that. Today in your, in your bulletin, you have a listening guide. It's a, it's a blank sheet, but I've discovered we live in a culture where people are always looking for advice. But in reality, they want approval first, affirmation second, long before they receive the advice. Now, I'm pretty safe. Uh, anybody here over 65? Raise your hand. Anybody? <laughs> I'm one of those. The rest of you, you can listen and take some good advice. But I, I think when we consider what God has to say to us about how we live, it's good that we take some good, sound advice from Scripture. If you have your Bibles, you want to turn to Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 to 15. But, but I want you to notice that the Harvard Business Review, if you notice this slide up here, they did a survey of top echelon leaders. And what they discovered was that the high-powered participants, those who are CEOs and CFOs, many of those people only listened actually to about a third of what was said and actually took about a third of the advice. So here's people who are leaders. When it comes to, to them needing counsel or seeking advice, they still did not apply two-thirds of it. But what's interesting is the other people, us who are in the lower echelon per se, or in a sense the other people, the other participants, the control group, they only listened to about half of the advice, and they only applied half of it. So we live in a culture which seems to want help but are you ready for this? On their terms. Amen? It's all on my terms. My kids, I love them. They, they want my advice as long as they ask for it. Amen? You know, it, we've passed that point of, of me giving unsolicited advice. But I've learned something. Kids are great. Notice these five-year-old responses. And, and I think some of this advice is really good. First of all, making your bed is a waste of time. Amen? I mean, you're going to get back in it anyway. Why make it? Secondly, don't tell your mother her diet isn't working. That's a smart kid. I love this one. Don't let a dog stand guard over your food. I mean, it's here one moment and gone the next. And I love this one. If you want to draw on the wall, do it behind the sofa. <laughs> Man, that'll preach. You know, if you want to draw, then listen to your brain. It has lots of information. Wow. Amen? 
We need to listen. We, a lot of us need some good advice, but in reality, I think here's the kid who says it best. I love this. Notice this. When at first you don't succeed, just sit down and eat cake and then try again. <laughs> That's my New Year's resolution, by the way. Yeah. You know, that makes sense, doesn't it? It makes sense when we consider the fact that we as people need to have some good advice in our world. And the important thing is we need to take it from God. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 3. I have it on the screen for you. But would you stand with me in reverence to God's word? I'd like us to stand together. I've given you the Christian Standard Bible version, which I hope will be an encouragement to you. Whatever translation you use. I hope that you'll refer to it throughout the message. But notice what Paul the Apostle says. Here's some sound advice. He says, my goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Not that I've already reached the goal or I'm already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Please make a note of that. I underlined it for you. Jesus is the seeking Savior. He takes hold of us. We cannot find him in our own strength or wisdom. We're grateful that he seeks us. Notice here verse 13. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, I forget what is behind and, and reaching forward to what is ahead. I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Now look at verse 15. Therefore, let us all who are mature think this way. Let us all who are mature, those of us who are growing in Christ, let us think this way. The Greek word has the idea of perfection or completeness. Let us all who are growing in Christ think like this. He says, and if you think differently about anything, notice this, God will reveal this also to you. I like that. Some of us struggle with what God's will for our lives is. But Paul's going to give us some sound advice on how we today can look at 2019 as a fresh slate of opportunity to serve God. Before we proceed, would you pray with me? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the power of your word. We thank you for your promises that are sure. The Bible says that your word will not return void, but will accomplish your purpose. So God, we pray right now, in Jesus' holy name, that you would speak to us. Father, that you would bind any hindrance that would come in this place today, that, Lord, most of all, that your Holy Spirit would be free to, to deal with each of us as you see fit. And Father, help us to apply these truths, not just to be hearers, but, Lord, to be doers of the truth. We give you praise, and I ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Well, here's what I consider to be the big idea. Uh, I want to give you, first of all, a, a growth goal. And as we look at Paul's advice to the church at Philippi, by the way, Paul writes this church, to this church from prison, and yet as he's in prison, he's expressing the great joy that he has for these folks because he sees in them the reflection of Christ at work. Even in the midst of their suffering and difficulties and all the troubles that they face, Paul recognizes this church brings him great joy because they're applying the truth. It's kind of like us having a dinner, inviting people over and never giving them a knife or fork. That would be considered ridiculous. You see, in order for them to apply the food that you prepared for them, they need the proper utensils. And so Paul is encouraging us today and admonishing us to follow some good biblical advice on how that literally we can pursue Jesus Christ day by day. Now here's the personal goal. I want you to consider how that you can make a resolution today and every day to where you count Christ as your supreme treasure. Why? Because 1 Corinthians 10 says, whatever we do, whether we eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. God wants to glorify himself in us. Isn't that a miracle? Amen? Are you all with me? Yes. You all had your coffee yet? Yes. Somebody bring the coffee. 
you know, the scripture makes very clear that God intends us to glorify him. And so when you think about your personal goal day by day, is Christ your supreme treasure? And are you seeking to bring glory to him day by day? Matter of fact, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there's your heart. Matter of fact, you could reverse it. Where your heart is, there's your treasure. So the question for us today is, are we willing to do whatever it takes to pursue Jesus Christ on a daily basis? And really, I want to share with you four simple things. And these are not profound. They're pretty much from the text, but I think we need to hear them. The first one is this, that Paul is saying to us that we need to pursue Jesus. Now, I wanted to put down here, desperately seeking Christ. I thought, wouldn't that be great? Because the scripture teaches us that he is the seeking savior he is the one who seeks and saves that which is lost but i think it's interesting that god through paul advises us to do to do what to pursue christ and and if you notice this passage i, I want you to recognize what the, it said three unique things number one to know him and to know him means that we're going to experience the power of his resurrection the fellowship of his sufferings and most of all to be conformed to his death notice this passage here in philippians chapter 3 paul says but everything that was gained to me i have considered to be a loss because of christ did you catch that he says more than that i also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing christ jesus my lord knowing christ jesus friends if we're going to pursue christ it's not just a head knowledge experience. It's not a superficial experience. It's really where we desperately seek to know him. Now, we can know about people. We can know about presidents. We can know about history. We can know about the past. It's hard for us to predict the future. But yet God wants us to understand that he has given us a clear indication of how we should live. And we need to understand that Christ needs to not only be a part of our lives but notice what he says because of him i've suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung or refuge that i might gain christ you see paul had an attitude his attitude was that i am in the business of knowing christ i'm going to know christ in the power of his resurrection i'm also going to know christ in who he is and when you think about that look at this next verse when he talks about the power of the resurrection in first corinthians 15 Paul says, and if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yeah, that's a tough verse. If you take away the resurrection, you take away the heart of the gospel. If you take away the resurrection, then you take away the fact that our faith is empty and meaningless. But notice what he says. Yes, he says we're found false witnesses of God. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Point blank. If you remove the resurrection, there's no hope. There's no salvation. If you take away the heart, not just of Christmas, but what we call Easter, where God is at work raising not only us to life in Christ, but we recognize that he is the faithful creator who has done all these things so we have the power of the resurrection but we also have the fellowship of his sufferings Paul, uh, peter says this very interesting look at verse 19 so then those who suffer according to god's will entrust themselves to a faithful creator while doing what is good folks hear me you and i are going to suffer for doing what's right wait a minute preacher i don't remember signing up for that I thought being a Christian was simply a rose garden experience. Amen? I mean, everything was going to be perfect. You know, pink sunglasses, nice curly hair. No. Being a Christian sometimes is painful because the world doesn't understand the gospel nor the experience that we have in Jesus Christ. So Paul says, my advice to you is pursue Jesus. Understand that we're to know him, we're to experience the power of the resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, but also to be conformed to his death. I love what Paul says here in Philippians chapter 3, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Saints, are you ready for this? We sing the song, Jesus is coming again. He's coming again. Maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, but... Friends, maybe soon. 
We don't know the calendar of God. God knows, but let me tell you something. He promised that he would return. He promised us. And so we're going to be conformed to his death because we're waiting for the Savior. And look what it says in verse 23. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body. Then I can be a runner. Amen? (laughs) So can you. I mean, I'm so tired of counting calories, aren't you? I mean... In, in my 67 years of life, I mean, I used to be an athlete, now I just have athlete's feet. But anyway, uh, I think I've lost about 412 pounds. But I gained about 625. So I'm losing that battle. Anybody say amen to that? I mean, it takes more than willpower. It, it, it takes a commitment to where we change. We change our eating habits. We change our diet. We, we change our perspective. We, we change our mind. And yet Paul says that, that we are going to be conformed to the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject, to subject everything to himself. Are you ready for this? If you know Jesus, you're different. If you know Jesus, you've been transformed from the inside out. By the way, your want-tos and your desires, and your behavior is different because you know Christ. Amen? That's important that we grasp that. That's important that we understand. So Paul is saying the first thing we need to do is pursue Jesus desperately. But then secondly, he says something very important. Notice this. He says that we should also forget the past. Now, this is hard. He says in Philippians 3, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead. Now, I want you to all say, ah, ah. I'm one of seven boys. Ah. I'm number five. Ah. That's why I don't have a neck. Ah. Because my brothers, older brothers blessed me. I should be six foot four, brother. But I'm not. I'm kind of like the potato head, you know, with the head that swivels, that's kind of, you know. And so when I grew up, I'll be honest, my brothers were mean to me, you know. My brothers didn't treat me well. Now, they would disagree with that. They would say, Bruce, you were spoiled. You were the baby of the family till the twins came along. Yeah. When I was seven and a half, those boogers were born. (laughs) And I lost my position. Yeah. But you know something, when you look at this, notice, take the next slide, brother. We need to forget the past. What it says is, remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. We need to let go of some of those things, some of those scars and pains. Because why? God is doing a new thing. And that new thing he's doing, he's doing because of Christ. And notice what he says now, it springs forth. Do you perceive it? God wants you to know, listen, folks, that he's at work in your life. There are no such things as accidents. Now, listen, we can do stupid things. I I get that. We can do things according to our own purpose and our own will. But in reality, God intends to do nothing but to give you a hope and a future, Jeremiah says. We get that. So we need to let go of the past, forgetting what is behind. So, folks, some of us have baggage. And some of that baggage is scars from the past, and it's pain. And and, and really, we've got hurt that we've never really dealt with. We've really struggled with that. And the scripture says that we should be willing to forget the past. Notice Colossians 3, verses 12 to 13. Paul says, therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, now catch this, folks, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so are you also to forgive. Church, hear me. There's no room in your life for bitterness. There's no room in your life for an unforgiving spirit because when we do those things, we give the devil an advantage. Now, he can't possess us. If you're a Christian, friends, listen to me. Greater is he that's in you than he is in the world, Amen. But I understand something. The devil is a yard dog on a chain. He can't read your mind, but he knows your actions. Why? Because our actions are public. And believe me, he wants to cause you, 
great pain, great injury, and truly great sorrow. Because his desire is that you not know Christ, that you not forget the past, that you not forgive others. Matter of fact, notice what, what this says here, point blank. I, I like this. If we can't forgive, notice what Mayo Clinic discovered. If you can't forgive, you're going to bring anger and bitterness into every relationship and their experience. And I don't know where you're at today with God. It could be this is the first time you've been to HBC. And I hope and pray you were greeted warmly. But if you're looking for the perfect church, please don't join it. Because the moment you join it, it ceases to be perfect. So none of us here today are perfect, but we know the perfect one. And so when you think about what Mayo Clinic discovered in their survey, when you don't forgive people, you literally become anger and bitter, and you carry that with you wherever you go. Have you ever met somebody like that? Yeah. Nobody wants to be around you. I mean, it's hard to have friends when you're always looking over your shoulder. But secondly, you become so wrapped up in the wrong that you can't even enjoy the present. You're afraid the shoe is going to drop again. You become depressed and anxious. You become a person that feels like your life means nothing. There's no purpose or that you feel that you really don't have God with you. You see, literally, we lose valuable connectedness with each other and especially with God. That's why we need to be people who forgive. So Paul's advice is not only... Should you pursue Jesus and forget the past, but you need to forgive. Now, why should we forgive? Look here at Matthew 6. Jesus says this, and do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, look at verse, verse 14. For if you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But notice this, but if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive your offenses. How does that make you feel? Those are the words of Jesus. What he says is point blank. If we can't forgive, then God can't forgive us. You see, forgiveness has conditions. You see, before God can forgive you your sins and trespasses, you must be willing to come to him and confess those sins, but you must also be willing to forgive others who've wronged you, who've hurt you. I have a dear friend who was in a business opportunity with a gentleman that wasn't a believer and and he knew that when he went in the business opportunity and, and they were partners together. And within the first 12 months, they were making huge money. But on the 13th month, his partner left and he took all the money with him. I mean, he today still doesn't know where this guy is. But all that money's gone. Does he have a right to be bitter? Sure. Does he have a right physically to be angry? You bet. But as long as he dwells on that, It'll eat him up. It'll eat him alive. So today, Paul is saying, I've got some good advice for you as you think about 2019. Desperately seek Jesus or forget the past, but also recognize that we're to forgive others. And I, I ran across this too from uh, the Time Magazine. Look at this. Uh, notice the next slide here. It says, as Time Magazine reported in a recent cover, this is 2017, clinical depression affects about 16 million people in the U.S., that means that in our society, at least uh, 5% of the population possibly is clinically depressed. But notice that that depression, those 16 million people, cost $210 billion a year in productivity loss and health care needs. You know why your insurance is so high? Because we're treating people who have unforgiving spirits. They are not willing to let go of the past. They're not willing to desperately seek Jesus. And really, they're in trouble. But notice that last sentence. Global revenue for antidepressants, are you ready for this? Is projected to grow nearly $17 billion by 2020. I got a tip for you. If you want to buy stock in 2019, buy it in a pharmaceutical company, amen? You'll get rich. Because in our culture, we have determined that it's all about us. And I am going to take care of me regardless of who it hurts or the cost involved. So Paul says, pursue Jesus, forget the past. But then thirdly, I want you to understand what he says also, trust Jesus for our future. Look at this. 
Philippians 3.13, but one thing I do, I forget what's behind, and I reach forward to what is ahead. We reach forward to what is ahead, not just in ourselves, but in Christ Jesus. And Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. <laughs> so many times we're so self-reliant. And I'm a guy, so guys, I'm talking to you. We're pretty sufficient in ourselves. We don't like to be told what to do. Am I the only one here today like that? I mean, we, we want advice, but we really want somebody to say, yeah, you're okay. We want that affirmation. But Paul says, look, not only do you pursue Jesus, not only should you forget the past, but also you need to look to the future and you need to give it to Jesus. Trust him. And notice what Paul says, I'm pressing on, but catch the words of Jesus. He says, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't worry. He says, if you believe in God, believe also in me. Friends, those are promises that we can take. No matter the situation, we can trust in God. And so when you think about trusting Jesus for a future, the Bible speaks that. Here in Philippians 3, 14, the next verse says this. He says, excuse me, in, in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, he says, therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. You know, as I get older, I've discovered I've got hair in my ears I never had. My nose is getting wider. Uh, I don't wear the same shoe size or the same pant size. I used to be taller, whatever that meant, but I'm getting smaller. So folks, don't lose heart, even though physically we're wasting away. Look at verse 17. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory. Wow, that far outweighs them all. So what are you going to do? Fix your eyes on Jesus, on that which is not just unseen, but also, he says, recognize that what is unseen is eternal. So fix our eyes not on what is real or seen, but fix it on Jesus. So for 2019, Paul is giving us good advice, sound advice that we understand it's important to trust Jesus with our future. But that brings us to the fourth point. We should answer God's call. And this is tough for some of us because we, we've kind of got the philosophy that we'll let George do it. But notice what Philippians 3 says, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. You see, Paul is saying that he continues to press forward he continues to recognize that God has a call in his life. That was a call, I think, first of all, we need to understand, is a call to salvation. Now, I've given you an illustration there of Stephanie Willis. Uh, Stephanie Willis was attending a crusade years ago in England, and uh, she came to Christ, and then she, she basically said, I, I want to volunteer for Billy Graham. And so for about three years, she volunteered in England and finally came to the United States, and and Billy Graham met her and said, you know, I, I'd like you to be my personal secretary. And so for 40 years, notice what she says, I knew this is where I belonged, working with Billy Graham and for the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. She sensed the call of God in her life. I have a son who's a school teacher. He tells me, Dad, I'm a Christian first, but I happen to be a school teacher by vocation, but I'm also on a mission, that class of 100, or those classes of 153 students is his mission field. And so he is on a mission. So first of all, are you, what are you pressing toward? What is your goal? And when you think about that, God wants us to answer the call of salvation. Look at this next slide, Romans 10, 8 to 10. Notice what it says in verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised you from the dead, you will be saved. Saved from what? Well, save from sin. Save from separation from God. Save from Satan. Save from yourself. We need a Savior. Notice what it says. For with a heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with a mouth, confession is made unto salvation. It's possible there's people here today. I am not God. I don't know your heart. But God does. And the question is, 
Are you desperately seeking Jesus? Have you forgotten the past and forgiven the offenders? Have you truly trusted Jesus with today and the future? But most of all, have you answered God's call to salvation? Because he gave his life for you. But then secondly, we need to answer God's call to service. Look at, look at Romans chapter 12. I beseech you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Adrian Rogers used to pastor Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee. He has since passed. He is with the Lord. But what a great preacher. I, I heard him preach years ago, and, and I, I closed my eyes, and he had this voice that sounded like the voice of God. I mean, when he preached, it was powerful. I mean, amazing. But Adrian Rogers said, as he read this text, the Lord said to him, Adrian, the problem with most Christians and the problem with most living sacrifices is they keep crawling off the altar. Present yourself a living sacrifice. He said, well, Lord, I know that a dead sacrifice isn't going anywhere. Well, that's true. That sacrifice is dead. But what's it mean to be a living sacrifice? It means that we surrender heart, soul, and mind to God. We answer his call to salvation. But we also say, like Isaiah said, Lord, here am I, send me. We're not afraid to move forward. The question is, have you answered God's call to salvation? Have you answered God's call to service? So let's review. Here's the big idea again. Put it back up there, brother. Here we're going to review the big idea. The growth goal was to discover biblical advice that guides my daily pursuit of Jesus Christ. So what has Paul said? Are you seeking to know Christ? Number two, have you really forgot the past? Number three, are you trusting Jesus? And most of all, have you answered God's call? So now you're saying, okay, preacher, so what? Now what? I want to ask you some questions. Next slide, brother. Put it up here. So what steps can I take today that will launch me forward in my pursuit of Christ? It could be that you've never made that decision for Christ. And I want to invite you to do that. This church exists for the sake of sharing the gospel. Everything that happens here today is not for those in this building, it's for those outside those buildings, amen? We want to reach people with the good news of Jesus Christ. So what is it that's hindering you from pursuing Jesus? Secondly, is there something from your past that you need to forget or you need to let go of or you need to forgive somebody? And listen, folks, God can't forgive us if we can't forgive those who've offended us. And by the way, you get a Baptist together, a bunch of Baptists together, you get six Baptists and you got, what, 21 opinions. I mean, you get 26 Baptists and you got four committees. I mean, we're famous for organizing. And in the midst of all that structure and stuff, it's easy for us to offend the people because sometimes we think it's about us. Can I just say this if, you, if you'll allow me to? We need to get over ourselves, folks. We need to let go of who we are and look to Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul is saying. And, and, and then ask yourself, who am I trusting for the future? Have I answered God's call to salvation? Am I willing to serve him? This church never has enough workers. I mean, this church needs Sunday school teachers, amen? This church needs people to work in the nursery. This church needs people to volunteers. You have an opportunity to go to East Asia and help the missionaries on furlough. I mean, what an opportunity. There's places for you to connect and fit and to serve. For your self-satisfaction? No. But for the glory of God and for those who need to know Jesus Christ. So what sound advice have we heard today? Number one, are you pursuing Christ desperately? Can you say amen? Have you let go of the past? Amen. Are you trusting Jesus for today and tomorrow? And have you answered his call? You know, I love Isaiah chapter 6. <laughs> Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. You know, I prayed as a kid, Lord, let me see, let me see Jesus. Let me see Jesus. I remember as a nine-year-old boy asking, God, if you're real, just show me. And I heard this laughter. <laughs> and I thought, wait a minute. 
where's this laughter coming from? And then a still small voice said, hey, Bruce, just look outside. It was springtime. The flowers were blooming. The birds were singing. And he said, I made that just for you. I made that just for you. And folks, listen to me. I went back and read Jeremiah chapter 1, and the Lord said that he knew my name before I was ever born, and he had called me for his purpose. And today I invite you to do that. We're going to have a moment of prayer and a time of reflection and response, and I don't know what God has said to you today, but I hope you've taken some sound advice. I know, guys, it's hard for us to take advice, but what better way for us to be successful in 2019 than to do what Paul has asked us to do? Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this beautiful day. We thank you for your promises that are sure. We're thankful, Lord, that your presence has been with us. And God, most of all, you've, you've shown to us your great love. That through Jesus Christ, we have the way, the truth, and the life. So God, have your way today as we commit to you in Jesus Christ. Amen. And I'm an old-fashioned Baptist preacher. And Jesus said, if you labor and are heavy laden, come unto me and I'll give you rest. And I don't know how this church always closes out their service, but I'm going to invite you to come. Allow this to be a prayer altar. If you have something in your life that you'd like to get rid of, let it go. I'll be glad to pray with you. Whatever's on your heart. Maybe there's somebody that brought you. Grab them. But don't leave this place without making the decision God has laid on your heart. And as your friend... I'm not your pastor, but I know there's deacons here that can come forward. I know there's other leaders that come forward, but if you want to come and pray, do that today.